Yeah, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers of this workshop for having me here. Uh, I noticed that I should have put the word spa somewhere in it to completely specify what I'm talking about. So what will I talk about? This is the aim, basically. I want to study relaxation in complex systems using Markov transition matrices defined in terms of sparse random graphs. So what I would like ideally to do is to study the random walk unbiased or biased on a structure like this. This is incidentally a part of the protein-protein interaction network of yeast. And people look at properties of random walks on such networks into, in order to just discuss robustness of cell signaling processes. OK, that's the long-term goal. Uh, here is how I uh, organize my talk. So the first part is mainly to set the notation and so on and so on, it's trivialities you all know about. And then I will uh, link Markov chains uh, to relaxation in complex systems by defining uh, them in terms of graphs. And I mention sort of special cases like unbiased random walks and uh, relaxation in complex energy landscapes as an example. And then we will go through a little bit the motions, uh, how, how this is all done. And since it's, this is non-rigorous, so I echo the previous speaker's uh, uh, remarks on this, uh, we'll have to do some tests in order to see how good we are. And then I'll summarize my results. So let's look at discrete Markov chains. So this is a physicist convention you multiply by the left, uh, on the left. So if you have a probability vector, you want to know it at time t plus 1. Uh, you multiply it with a Markov transition matrix. The matrix element needs to be non-negative, and the column sums need to be normalized to 1. So this condition implies generally that you expect the spectrum of uh, the transition matrix in the disk of radius 1 in the complex plane. If your W satisfies a detailed balance condition with some equilibrium distribution, then it's the spectrum is real, even if W is not symmetric itself, and it is in the interval uh, minus 1, 1. So, and you know, or you all know about uh, uh, peron frobenius theorems. You have exactly one eigenvalue, which is plus 1 for every irreducible component of your uh, phase space. And assuming absence of cycles, all other eigenvalues in that ergodic component will be less than 1. And uh, if you look at sort of evolution from an initial condition on uh, after t time steps, then what you get is a component which is the equilibrium distribution and then the summation over all eigenvalues which are less than 1. Uh, teeth powers, left eigen right eigenvector corresponding to this eigenvalue and then the projection of the initial distribution on the left eigenvector. And that, this equation allows you to, to relate eigenvalues with relaxation times of this Markov process via this relation. So the upshot of this is if you know the complete spectrum of relaxation times, uh, of the complete spectrum of eigenvalues of a stochastic matrix, you will know the spectrum of relaxation times, the complete spectrum. And this is what I uh, uh, try to do. Uh, on sparse graphs. So let's, uh, let's see how I construct my matrices. I will construct them in terms of weighted random graphs. I assume that they are large, so I have a graph with n vertices. And I start out from a rate matrix, which is defined in terms of a connectivity matrix. These elements are either 0 or 1, depending whether an edge is there or not. And then there will be positive weights which may be random, uh, in terms of which I define my rate matrix. And then my Markov transition matrix is just the rate matrix divided by the column sum in order to make a column sum of this W uh, equal to 1. If I defi define my graphs in terms of graph ensemble, it's unavoidable that I occasionally have isolated sites. So in order to make this um, Markov matrix as well for those, I will have a, a 1 on that diagonal element. Otherwise, all, all eigenvalues which are for which gamma ij are, are 0, they will be 0. So this is the specification 
of my uh, Uh, no, actually, it's it's not. I could I could uh, I could do uh, continuous time as well. Actually, uh, so this is based on work which I did sort of several years ago, and there is in principle a solution for a graph Laplacian for a standard graph Laplacian, which would be the object where, which you, which you would put into a continuous time master equation. So uh, yes, it's not essential, but this is the language I chose at this point. So if you wish, you can write down a master equation operator by, by, by subtracting basically a 1 from the diagonal. So you write this, uh, this difference equation, which in the limit, if you go to rates, would then actually give you the sort of continuous time master equation if you scale properly uh, the, weight, the weights with time. So here's a special case which I want to uh, mention <coughs> at the outside. If all weights are 1, then my transition matrix is basically I can, can go from J to I uh, uh, with this probability uh, Cij over Kj, where Kj is the, uh, uh, the, the degree of the, uh, of the vertex J, the originating vertex. So basically I decide with equal probability which of the neighboring vertices I uh, visit at any step. Uh, for that, the master equation operator would then be just this object. So this is one of the special cases when we will, we will look at that uh, in a moment. So what I've been doing so far is related to a case where I, can, when I, where I have either symmetric transition matrices from the outset, so if they are Markov, they are bi, mar, uh, sort of bistochastic, or if they satisfy a detailed balance condition with some equilibrium distribution, I can symmetrize them for an equilibrium distribution. So I should say none of this, this, is, this is new work. None of this is written up except in pen and pencil in this talk. So it's not completely developed for general asymmetric matrices. So if I symmetrize the Markov transition matrix to get this curly W, which then is symmetric, we know that the spectrum will be real and this symmetric st symmetry structure is of course inherited uh, by the Markov transition matrix of this talk. So and all, all the methods that I will now use in order to compute spectra for such systems uh, will be restricted to this case so far. I believe that the general case on sparse graphs is in reach there is actually one rigorous result I am aware of if you uh, use this construction, this construction with gamma matrices as I do here in the general case and the gamma ij are just arbitrary, then if you are on a large graph fully connected, then the spectrum of the matrices in the limit n goes to infinity if the graph is not sparse turns to the uniform measure on the unit disk. This is work by Bordenave and company some three, four years ago. So, <coughs> yeah, stop. Um, yeah, so let's uh, look at the unbiased random walk. We start from this uh, transition matrix. We put uh, diagonal elements equals to one on isolated sides. And then the symmetrized ve version is just this. I divide by the square root of the product of the uh, degrees uh, which are connected by Cij. And uh, if I were the corresponding symmetrized uh, master equation operator has a special name. It's called normalized graph Laplacian, which uh, some people look to uh, s s study specifically to study random walks on graph. Um, my uh, informatics colleagues tell me that uh, they look, for instance, at uh, hopping of data on the internet, and this is Internet 2007, in terms of uh, 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 such structures. So this would be an application if I have non-uniform edge weights, because uh, the transition depends on whether I have a high bandwidth line or not, and it depends on traffic, and it will actually also not be constant in time, but possibly slowly varying constantly. So, 
Another uh, interesting application would be uh, relaxation in complex energy landscapes. So if I look at Kalmar's transition rates for hopping between inherent states in a complex energy landscape with energy AJ as my starting energy, a barrier height VIJ that needs to be overcome in order to get to the state I, and, and I take these to be not fully connected. So meaning that sort of my, my transition matrix is basically sparse, but it has these structures. This amounts to a generalized trap model of the type that Jean-Philippe Bouchot and others have studied uh, for many years. Um, and, uh, and the interest is then, can I, for instance, by increasing beta going by lo to low temperature, see sort of the uh, elements of glassy physics there. So the, the, the Markov process becoming slow, relaxation times becoming very, very large. Uh, that's the kind of question I'm interested for models of this type. So in this matrix, too, uh, satisfies a detailed balance condition with, uh, with this distribution where gamma i is just a, a column sum, the i-th column sum of this, of this uh, gamma ij matrix. And I have these energies. Uh, the, um, this Gibbs factor. And so as I have a detailed balance condition, I can symmetrize that matrix and my tools will be applicable to this situation as well. And sort of detailed balance is sort of the condition that will be satisfied for many physical relaxation processes. Unless I drive a system which I, when I will, and then I will not have it. So let's, let's sort of now move from uh, sort of preliminaries to, uh, to, um, to calculation of spectra. And I will do that separately for the unbiased random walk and for general Markov matrices, although the unbiased random walk is a special case of the second one. It turns out that there's sort of a shortcut to do the, uh, to do the spectrum and the, the equations are much closer to, to those uh, we derived uh, some years ago for, for a spectra of adjacency matrices in sparse graphs. So let's go uh, to, this, uh, to this calculation. You all know that you can compute the spectral density of a, of a matrix A, which might be a Markov matrix, the graph Laplacian or symmetrized master operator, via this resolvent identity. So I take the imaginary part of the trace of the resolvent and I include a small imaginary part in this, in this eigenvalue. Um, then uh, to get the inverse, to get, the, to get this inverse power, I can get it by ta taking a derivative of a logarithm of this object. And since the trace of the logarithm is, is the logarithm of the determinant, I can play with powers to get uh, the logarithm of 1 over the square root of the determinant. And that's this identity, which means, in, in, in essence, and this is something very old, that I can get the spectral density by a derivative of the logarithm of a Gaussian integral, which, has, uh, which is basically a statistical physics temp uh, system at, Im at imaginary inverse temperature. Now, all problems in that we get in evaluating partition sums in statistical physics is not, is the, the problem is not related to the value of the temperature. The problem is often related to the interaction. So I can try my tools from statistical physics to evaluate this object. And the, the essential thing is I have to, to evaluate the average of the logarithm of this uh, uh, Gaussian integral. And I will use replica identities to, to perform that. You can convince yourself that the average of the logarithm is just this limit. 1 over n times the logarithm of the nth power of this, uh, uh, of this Gaussian integral. And then what you do is you take integer n initially, and then the nth power of, a, uh, of this integral is just uh, the, the partition function of, a, of n copies, n identical copies of the system uh, for which you can do this average. And then you just take the naive uh, uh, analytic continuation to the reals and take the limit n goes to zero. 
It's turned out, it turns out that since we are starting from a Gaussian integral, which is either well-behaved, and we ensure that it's well-behaved by putting this convergence uh, generating factor, which either is well-behaved or doesn't exist, so we really don't expect any difficulties with the replica trick at this level. In fact, uh, the solutions, the type of solutions in terms of order parameters, as we shall find them, correspond to a fully symmetric high temperature solution. It turns out, though, you would think, well, that's trivial. A high temperature solution is trivial. But on the sparse graph, even the high temperature solution has a lot of structure. And this structure is reflected in complicated structures of the spectra. So let's go for it. Um, the first step is I take the non-isolated sites, which I call curly n, and the set of isolated sites as its component. My partition function is clearly the product of these. The isolated sites, the, the Gaussian integral on the isolated sites, I can do. This is just an inverse. What do you mean by temperature? Um, if you have a Hamiltonian, and uh, so some Hamiltonian, you want the partition function. And equilibrium statistical physics is just you do your integral multiple integral dui e to the minus beta Hamiltonian, which depends on all your u. Temperature here is yes, beta, the beta, no, beta, the i, the i, this, this beast in my situation is the imaginary unit. So, and beta is 1 over k Boltzmann t if I do classical statistics. Exactly, exactly. So my, in, this, in this case, my temperature is, happens to be imaginary. That's, of course, unphysical. It's just to, to, to evaluate this integral, and this is what I need in order to get the spectral density. It's an entirely formal thing. The integral exists. Yes. We will come to that. We will come to that. Um, so... We isolated our isolated sites, and then we are really only concerned with the interacting part, which is via non-isolated site. And we have this multiple Gaussian integrals. Now, for these, I know that all the ki's are uh, um, uh, non-zero, so I can rescale my integration variables by 1 over square root ki, and so I get, uh, after rescaling, I get this integral. And this is something which has a random diagonal element. And, uh, and this, just this, uh, this, this uh, connectivity matrix element defining the graph as, as the interaction. And this kind of structure we have looked at sort of some four or five years ago. And this is why I can do it. With respect to the diagonal elements, I don't have to worry. It's usually self-averaging with respect to them. Although, I should say, this is a little bit a hand-waving argument. But you can convince yourself that it works. So I'll take shortcuts here because I like to sleep occasionally. So. Another shortcut I will take, which I should really not do, or you can do the full calculation just to simplify sort of the storyline for presentational purposes, I will use a canonical graph ensemble. So this, uh, the probability that Cij is uh, probability of the matrix elements is given just by this, by this distribution. So with uh, Ki, Kj divided by Cn, you have a link with 1 minus Ki, Kj over Cn. You don't have a link. And then it's a symmetric matrix. That does not reproduce exactly the degrees. It just gives a distribution such that a, a link, a, a site with ki has on has a, all sites with with ki equals k, a certain value of k. Uh, the distribution of actual connectivities is Poisson with that mean. That's something which I strictly shouldn't do, but the math is much simpler, and sort of my arguments will be a bit more transparent. I didn't want to bother you with sort of lengthy formula. So if I if I do that, then uh, if I go back. Um, uh, this, this integral factors with respect to the Cij, and so does the average here, if I use this distribution of, of the average. 
So I can do this average, and if I ev evaluate things, I get this typical structure. My integral has the diagonal part, and then it's the exponential of an exponential term over side. So that's the typical structure that you get, which you would also get by, in, by looking at standard Adder-Schrenyi graphs. The degree sequence ki, I haven't specified. It could be anything. It could be power law distributed. It could be constant. It could be you name it. All I need to know is that the average degree c exists and is finite. It can be arbitrarily large. So I'm so far restricted to degree sequences, infinite degree sequences, for which the mean degree is finite. On the left, you're looking at the expectation of the effect of that measure, correct? Exactly, exactly. And on Sorry, what, what n are you? have a product of i is in the curvy n. If you go down. Yes. So isn't that the random? No, 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 no. This is not a normal. This is just this. The curvy n is the set of non-isolated sites. This is this. No, no. I'm, I'm, I'm already, I'm already restricting this for all, for all non-isolated sites. The ki's. Uh, are there. They, they are given by the Ki sequence. Now I have it, and now I average over C matrices compatible with this set of non-isolated sites and distribute it according to this. Okay? So I have this structure, uh, which is now ob obviously horrible, because if you look at the Ij sum in this, it's, cu it's, it's coupled in incredibly complicated ways, different sites. So I need to decouple this double sum. Here's an integral. This is diagonal. I don't mind this. But this is far from diagonal. If I expand this exponential, it gives sort of uh, all powers of these replicated variables uia. This a, little a, is an, a replica index which goes from, from 1 to little n, the number of replicas. I should have said that. So in order to decouple this side, I introduce this kind of replicated density, which roughly up to this factor is the fraction of sites at which the replica variable uia has the value ua. And that's, that's an n, these are n components. So this is, my, this is a kind of replicated density. I enforce that using a sort of Fourier representation of this delta function. So I get a con co corresponding conjugate variable rho hat of u. And, uh, and uh, this double sum becomes then a double integral over these beasts. Okay? So, uh, which, which then means I can write my, my average over the nth power of this partition function as a functional integral over this density and its conjugate. And the term in the exponential is just scales exponentially in system size. And there's one term which is related to this bond expression. And you r realize, again, we have the exponential of this beast, with this, which is this exponential factor in the, in the couplings, which comes from the writing of the double sum in terms of an integral of these roots. Then this is, part from, this is part of the Fourier transform of my density of this row in terms of a conjugate. And then, of course, I have the conjugate, which enforces the definition that this is related in some ways to sites. So now I've decoupled sites. That's brilliant. So I've, uh, basically, the site integral was initially, and an, uh, so this is uh, this is, uh, was initially an, uh, a product of independent integrals over sites, and I I group them according to the same degree, which which introduces a due an average over the degree distribution of this thing. So that's fine. Sites are decoupled. I have a, I have a situation where I can uh, apply the saddle point method to do that integral. However, replica are still horribly coupled in this unknown object, which I have to find. Uh, and I find rho and rho hat by doing a variation with respect to them of, the, of, this, of this sum of uh, gb, gm, gs. But I can't do that, really solve it, and take the n goes to 0 limit un unless I make some assumption about the structure in replica space. And the structure is a so-called replica symmetric structure. So I write rho of u 
as a continuous superposition of complex Gaussians uh, of this form. And the complex Gaussians are such, this is a product over replicas. So this, this product gives an exponential of sum over ua squared. So this is not only uh, permutation invariant in replica, but also rotationally invariant in replica. And that's the high temperature assumption that creeps in here. Um, it has been shown on previous occasion that this is exact. I mean, it's not rigorous, so here's really something for you guys. Uh, uh, prove that this is rigorous. <laughs> and I do the same for this I hat, and then what? Well, um, I've, I've, uh, I've done, I've, I went through these motions for adjacency matrices some years ago, and, uh, and uh, I recover known limiting cases like, uh, like the keston mckay distribution for, for regular random graph in the large C limit starting from here, taking n to infinity first, then c to infinity, the large average connectivity to infinity. On an Erdos-Rheny graph, I recover the circular law, which is rigorously established by, uh, by people in this audience. So, so in, in this sense, I don't have uh, problems with that. There's another, there's another way of uh, looking at this. Uh, so this type of sparse graph problem using replica was first addressed 1988 or so by Bray and Rogers. They came up with an integral equation in terms of which is the density it defi is defined, which nobody could solve, not even on a computer. However, there was an independent derivation of this using supersymmetry methods by Fyodorov and Mirlin, who came up with the same equation I should say that that is restricted for unit weights, so not, no, weight, no fluctuation on the weights. And the Bray-Rogers integral equation was shown to be rigorous by Kurushny and some other guys in Kharkov, I believe, they said. So there is some rigorous underpinning of this, uh, of this, uh, of this world. So now that I do this superposition, then of course I will get self-consistency equation in terms of these weight functions. I have an unknown, I know that rho is a density, so I know that pi of omega is a density. I don't know necessarily that conjugate is a density. So I, I introduce an unknown factor such, such that I want this pi to be a density. So this is the way. And then you go through the motions, you in, insert all these, uh, these guys into these positions and extract the small n limits, the, the small n small limit, and you get self-consistency equation for the pi's. You can even eliminate the conjugate one. And then what you're left with is this integral equation uh, for this density of pi of omega. This is for omegas in the, with positive real part. It's a sum over all coordinations larger than or equal to 1. This, uh, this combination de degree distribution times k over c. And then a multiple integral of this b. So this is a highly nonlinear integral equation. Looks horrible. So what should I do with it? Uh, well, at least it exists and all terms are well defined in, in terms of this thing. The, the, the interesting thing is that this is an integral equation for a density. So this is a stochastic system, and there's a stochastic population dynamics algorithm to solve them. So I represent my density, pi of omega, by a large population of randomly initialized omegas. And then what I do, I pick a k according to this distribution. I pick k minus one omegas according to this, independently, uh, according to the pi distribution. I evaluate this object and replace a randomly chosen omega by this object. And I repeat that very, very often until I get to equilibrium. So this is a Markov process on this set of omegas that equilibrates fairly fast. And this is a very efficient algorithm to solve that in a stochastic sense. Um, this, is now, this is now the settle point. 
this the script n is actually hidden here this is a this n times c is a renormalized c times script n i was being i'm a little bit sort of brushing over things but there are there are some subtle details i average over a degree distribution which is now a degree degree, degree distribution restricted to the non isolated sites which slightly modifies my average degree on that it's slightly higher but uh, 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 it's it's there it's there but once i'm at the saddle point level at the saddle point level i i just have to find self consistency equations for these rows and row hats which go, give the stationary solution of this stationary contribution to this integral once i have it i can take the little n to zero limit divide by n then take the then take one over capital n and take the n capital n to infinity limit to get to the spectral density of this and that's the le the last formula so all n's disappear and my spectral density is uh, delta peak at 1 for the isolated sites that's where i put the isolate i put a 1 on these diagonal elements plus this sum which i can evaluate well i won't do this multiple integrals and sum i will again do this via sampling from the population Uh, there are limiting cases where I can. We'll come to that. But the, the general case, I, I don't. I, the n to the little n to zero limit has been performed in this equation. This is only true in the little n number of replicas goes to zero limit. So where does little n come in? As the number of replicas, which. Oh, no. Yeah, uh, I went through this fast. It, it will reappear in the general Markov case. We will see it there more explicitly. I wanted, I wanted to have the, this out of the way. Uh, this is the simpler case. Uh, this may be clarified uh, uh, slightly later, so where, where the structure is also slightly different, but there are similarities. So I have, a I have an equation for the spectral density, which I can evaluate, and we'll see. Uh, and there's an interesting bit here, and I would, this, this is, uh, this is uh, it, it would require some time to, 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 to make the point in detail. These distributions pi of omega, they have a, they have a singular part located on the imaginary axis, which is a, is a set of measure zero in the right half plane, and, and the rest. And the singular part is related to localized states in the system, whereas the other part is related to actually extended states. What is pi? Pi is the distribution of. Uh, so my, I introduce these replicated order parameters in order to, these row of u's. I introduced them a while er earlier in order to decouple sides, and these rows I then represent as infinite continuous superpositions of complex Gaussian. This pi distribution in this, at the settle point will, may or may not develop a singular part which is bound on the imaginary axis. Those are my localized contribution to the localized density of states. And in the right half plane, it will be sort of the extended states. So uh, just. Exactly, exactly. And we will, we will see that happening. We will see that happening. So in fairly complex ways, and there are still algorithmic issues, I should say, I mean, uh, that need to be sorted in order to, see, to do the things in an optimal way. So just to take the promise, a non-rigorous promise that it can be done and is con correspond. And we've checked that for uh, random Schrodinger operators on a graph by looking at inverse participation ratios that this, this identification that I'm making is correct. So. Now let's look at Markov matrices. I do the same decomposition in isolated and non-isolated sites before. On the non-isolated sites I can do the rescaling and I get this kind of Gaussian integral now before where I have the gamma i's sitting on this side, but these gamma i's are related to the set of k i j's on the links. 
that's, uh, that's, a, that's a different structure now, uh, different in different ways. So what I do is I replace the gamma i by its definition as the sum over uh, kijs. And, I've, and then I symmetrize that. And now I have this integral, which is still a Gaussian integral, which is still a Gaussian integral. But note that whereas the lambda was previously in my random walk examples was, uh, was coupled to, to sort of localized uh, uh, sort of diagonal elements of a matrix, is now actually um, coupled to link variables in an interesting way. This gives a different structure to, to what to the calculations have to perform, interestingly. Um, I should be able to recover that, but since this is all fresh, the work has not been completely done. But the main point is I can go, th go through the motions with this, evaluate it, check whether, whether I can trust my results, and we'll see, I mean, I will show whether we can. So there's a different structure now as the eigenvalues couples to bond variables, which we didn't have before. Previously, the eigenvalues were multiplied with the degree of sites. Here, it's, uh, it's more complicated. So we do replica again. We get the same kind of uh, uh, exponential of exponential. But now, there is an additional average over the, the values of the bond variables in this thing. And the quadratic form in this exponential is also differ different. However, um, this double sum that I have here, I can decouple it if I use this canonical graph average, which I have done. I can re decouple it with the same kind of replicated density I've introduced in the previous case, which gives me, again, uh, a path integral over these densities and their conjugates. Again, a, t a, s a term related to bonds, a term which is related to the Fourier representation of these delta functionals, and a side term, uh, which is a little bit simpler now. So this is the structure uh, I have in, uh, in this uh, general Markov case. Again, uh, I would have to do variations with respect to these densities in order to find a stationary point, to do a saddle point integration. And do the replica number of replica goes to zero limit, which I cannot necessarily do. So I make this ansatz again as superpositions in terms of Gaussians. Here it is again, same equation. And then that's something I do. I, I did my average uh, in, in a canonical graph ensemble, but I can sort of undo that, which I should do to take the microcanonical graph ensemble. And here is my set of. And here now we see the little n. Uh, you see this, this bond part. Oops. Yes, here it is. These things, what I need to I isolate is the contribution of order little n in these things. And here you see them. There is a little n contribution. There's a little n contribution. There's a little n contribution. There's of order one contributions as well from my unknown coefficients, but they cancel. So everything uh, up to a term of order little n squared and higher, uh, the little n is there. And these z of omegas uh, are just sort of the normalization constants of these, of these Gaussian integrals. Now, I can write this z2 of omega as a product of normalization constants of, of a single z in this form. And that will allow me now uh, to do variation with respect to pi's and pi, uh, to, to the pi's and pi hats. I get fixed points equations. I can again eliminate uh, the conjugate variable, and and this is uh, this is the fixed point equation that I get now for for the, this pi function. On the surface of it, it has almost the same form, except that there is an average over the over the uh, bond weights which are involved here. Otherwise, it's the same. It's the same horrible nonlinear structure. And the definition of these guys is different. So there's a, there's a term which, where the lambda multiplies the weight, but there's another term which has a sort of a different structure. Now, in order to get the, 
spectral density, I have to take the, the, the derivative of the logarithm of this beast with respect to lambda and divide by n. And this is now, the lambda is now sitting in the bond part. Whereas previously, my spectral density was sort of a sum over sides in a natural way, which because initially it was a trace. This is in the, in the, in the canonical basis. It's a sum over sides. And I lose it in this context. So my spectral density is now the real part of this double integral, which is related to bonds. Don't ask me why. I find this entirely non-transparent. I believe I can get back to a formulation in terms of sum over sides by investing the structure of the fixed point equation. I have just not found the time up to this point to do that. So this is something for the, for the paper that is to be written. But this is my spectral density. And actually, I forgot to mention there is, of course, the singular part, the, the one, the delta function at one from the isolated sides. Yes. So this is For, for every symmetric Markov ma matrix or f uh, symmetrizable via uh, some similarity transformation, if it satisfies detail balance. For, you know, no, no. There is one thing that, uh, that uh, uh, I mentioned is it is large. So I have a large, sorry? No, no, I'm, I'm looking at the limit n goes to infinity. So my, my Markov chain has n states, and I need the n goes to infinity limit. That's, that's, so this is not for two-state Markov chain in two states. Okay. We'll come to that. Okay. So this is, so this is the general case, which is, which is defined in terms Initially, in terms of a degree distribution, which uh, the de de degree dis distribution actually determines what my stationary pi's is. If I have the stationary pi's, uh, the distribution of link variables actually determines what is happening here. So that should be general, uh, valid for arbitrary degree distribution as long as the uh, mean degree exists and also for arbitrary k distributions, as long as these integrals and averages can be done. So it's a fairly wide class of models that, uh, that, that this should apply to. Now we come to analytically tractable limiting cases. Just the, let's look at the unbiased random walk. And let's take a regular random graph. In the regular random graph case, there is no distribution p of k. All k's are c, my average degree. So uh, my, uh, this should be a small k. So my degree distribution is concentrated at the mean degree. And then every side is equivalent. All the, so it makes sense to, to make this under. It's pi of omega is actually a, a delta function concentrated at some unknown mean. Right? If I insert this under into this equation, I get a self-consistency equation for this unknown mean. If I solve, this is a quadratic equation. I can solve that if I insert that into my equation for the spectral density. I get this equation for the spectral density. This is what you, this is close to the keston mckay distribution, except it's been normalized such that it is the distribution for a corresponding Markov module. So this is a trivial modification of the keston mckay distribution, which has, strangely enough, not I haven't seen it in the literature, but it's a trivial modification. And Keston probably knew about it and McKay and didn't bother to write it down explicitly. This is one of the analytically tractable limiting cases I have. The other one is erdos rini graphs in the large C limit. Now, in the large C limit, my distribution gives almost all weights to degrees which are C plus fluctuations of the order of square root c, which is then, if c is large, negligible compared to this c. And then asymptotically, again, all sides are basically equivalent. Uh, I make, so then my pi will be approximately, and this approximately equal will become equal in c goes to infinity, concentrated on some unknown mean. I get this, and I should evaluate this really only in the large c limit. 
So I get this uh, same keston McKay equation, which I should, however, which is now restricted to the large C limit, where after su suitable rescaling, this becomes a Wigner semicircle. I haven't been able to finish the same limiting. I expect that the general Markov case also allows a large C adash Rainy limit, which simplifies the thing, but not down to this level because the unknown K distributions are still there. So I, I'm, at this moment, I'm unable to tell you about that. I believe there is a semi-closed form uh, for the general Markov cases in the large C limit. Note I'm taking first the limit n goes to infinity and then the limit c goes to infinity. This is slightly different than what is sort of known here that you take n and c at the same time large. c is some power of n and so on. Okay, so this is, uh, this is, uh, this is sort of the theoretical background. Uh, how, long, how much do I have? Ten minutes? Yeah, yeah okay. So... Um, so let's, since all this was sort of a little bit sort of hand waving and stuff, let's see how we are for numerical tests. So this is a, this is first a simulation. I take a Poisson adash Rini graph with a very small mean. And this is a numerical spectrum, fairly large matrices, graphs with thousand vertices, average over five thousand samples. 501 bins, so it's fairly fine, and this is a fairly intricate structure spectrum. So this is the simulation, and now let's see what our population dynamics algorithm says. It finds a few more of these localized states. Um, I should say that the number of localized states I find, the spectrum is basically symmetric, so this the arrangement of delta peaks is not random. Whatever delta peak you find here, you find typically on the other side, although I need to run my population dynamics really and average over many, many, many uh, uh, sort of over long runs. Some of the smaller delta peaks I don't see on both sides. But wherever I see a symmetry, this is a true symmetry. You see this delta peak here. There is one, one satellite. It's on the other side. Those are independent calculations. These are true localized states. And for, for some of them, <coughs> you can identify them with lattice animals on a graph. So finite chains, clusters, isolated rings, stars, you name it. So, Sorry? Good question. There is. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, it is filled with localized states. This is a kind of Lifshitz tail. So what you see here is in red, the population dynamics results, and the red is the extended states, and they break down here. There's a mobility edge. And the rest is filled uh, with localized states. So the green is the total density of states. Uh, at one, we have... Uh, First, the isolated, so the, the eigenvalues one for each localized component, and since this is Poisson two, there are many, uh, many small sites, so there are few. And in order to see the total density of states, I have to keep a small regularizer, which broadens a delta peak into a Lorentzian of width epsilon, and that at some point uh, disturbs the signal that I should see here. But it's known; I can sort of by investing computational effort, I can get down fairly close to and rule. Yes, it's a very, my, my, my reading of this, my reading of this is, look, transport cannot be arbitrarily slow because to have to, for modes to contribute to transport, the states must be extended. The states, extended states have, a, have an open gap so all modes which contribute to transport have a maximal relaxation time, which, call, which is related to this gap. I don't know enough about disordered metals in order to see whether, whether this might be related to the concept of minimum metallic conductivity. Maybe, Tom, you know more about it. But, um, uh, so see this as, as, as part of my ignorance in this field. It's, it needs to be checked. So something I didn't say is I can do this 
all this thing also on single large instances. So this population dynamics has a sister algorithm where I can do it. I take a graph, like 10,000, 100,000, 200,000. I put the links on a graph. And then I run the random walk. And here is. Uh, blue is population dynamics, so this is the average. It's a, it's a less precise uh, evaluation than on the previous. It's older. And the green one is one single realization run on a single graph of 10,000 sites. So that's also possible and could be interested if you are actually interested in single large instances. All I need in order to, for that to be reliable is that these graphs are locally tree-like. So, which means if loops, as if there are any, should be long and not regularly distributed. So, so here's the regular random graph example. And the gr now let's see. The population dynamics is red. And uh, my, my analytic derivation is superimposed on green on it. And so my asymptotic analysis of this case is at least on the level of pictures, which I'm happy with, but you may not be, uh, seems to be OK. And here is the same for the large C Adashreni. Again, in red is my uh, population dynamics results. And in green is the large C Keston McKay uh, modified to, to capture uh, Markov matrices. And again, this is on top of each other. I'm happy you may still have issues with it. So now let's do this unbiased random marks on a scale free graph. Uh, this is a power law distributed with minimum degree one, all states localized. Because most sites are either uh, uh, sort of. Most, most things are on chains, on short chains. If I uh, increase the degree, the minimum degree to 2, it's totally diff diff different. Simulation is green, and over, over, over the green, there's a red curve for population dynamics. And this is basically uh, the same curve. So these are two curves, one in green and one in red, uh, for the full density of states. And then if I can increase gaps, increase the k-min to 3. So let's see the trend. Uh, this is all localized. K, the minimum k is 1. k2 is, uh, has some localized states. There's a small gap here. I haven't ex exhibited. If I get to a larger k, the gap larger, uh, uh, increases. And the structure becomes a bit more boring. But this is a scale-free graph up to the lower cutoff, which is uh, of some interest. So and here now I have a general stochastic matrix. I take my energies all zero and my, my uh, uh, rates, the, 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 uh, these k's, the, the weights, to be e to the minus beta times some random potential, which I take to be uniform on 1. And the left. Uh, left is simulation results compared with population dynamics. Wait a minute. Simulation results compared with population dynamics. And right uh, is population dynamics, uh, total density red, and extended states green. So there is a, there's a, this is total density of states. Simulation and uh, population dynamics, they are on top of each other. There are small gaps. If I isolate the extended states, then there is a gap of extended states in the middle where, where I have localized states, and there will be gaps here. Uh, now, let's crank up the, this was beta equals 2. Beta equals 2. Now, let's crank uh, up beta, so lower the temperature. Then my rates become small. And there are two effects. There is higher weight in the, in, in, the eigen, in the density near 1. So there are more slower modes, typically slower modes. The other effect, what you see here is the extended states in red and the total density of states in green. So there is a big gap in the bulk where there are only localized states, um, which the size of the gap was surprising to me. There is an issue here. I haven't been able to check 
that's with simulations because the standard simulation, so standard diagonalization routines which you get from ice pack or so, they pass out on this problem because you have this wide range of different matrix elements in this game. So here is still some, so take this as my contribution to Fool's Day if it turns out to be wrong. Um, yeah, here's sort of, again, the, uh, the same problem and uh, uh, looking at the tail, so here's the total density of states, so beta equals five, and there is now on a logarithmic scale, uh, we have these, uh, these Lifshitz tails. This folds into the broadened delta peak as one. It would go down all the way to one if I could decrease my epsilon, so. Yes, so what we've seen is density of states concentrates at the edges at be as beta increases, so I get slow modes, and the contribution of localized states to the density of states also increases in the bulk. Uh, this is just the simulation, I believe. Yes, this is just the simulation where I have now different distribution for the case, exponentially distributed case, with mean t, and it turns out that this is independent of the mean because it gets normalized by the column densities anyway. And for different t, these curves lie on top of each other. This is just to say, to, just to see that my population dynamics respects this uh, thing. So here we are. This is what I've uh, uh, done. So if stochastic matrices defined on random graphs, what we see is localized states, states at the edges typically. So there are gaps. I can. I don't have analytic results for the gaps in general, <coughs> except for some of the limiting cases. <coughs> Question whether this is related to minimal met metallic conductivity is not to be found out. For uh, rates which are exponentially distributed, this is independent of the mean. Similarly, for uniform rates, it's, not, it's, it's also independent of the mean. If I have... Um, exponentially, so k's, which are then power law distributed, this was k is e to the minus beta v. Uh, I have localization effects at large betas and uh, concentration of uh, density of states at the edges, which corresponds to slow dynamics, essentially. I think this is what I, uh, this uh, I say for later. So this is where I would like to stop. Thank you for your time.